welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. I'm John O'Shea, Scientific Director of NIAMS, and this week is a special lecture, the G. Burroughs Miter Lecture, a time we get to salute one of our own intramural investigators. Dr. Miter was the first NIH Director of Laboratories and Clinics, a precursor to Michael's job um, and the DDIR. This MITRE lecture is presented annually by an intramural scientist to recognize and appreciate outstanding contributions to biomedical research. And we're certainly getting a treat today um, with our speaker, Mariana Kaplan. Now the astute uh, Walls uh, attendees surely will be wondering, didn't we just have a MITRE lecture a, a few weeks ago with Bridget Wiedemann? Uh, and you're, you're right. Today's MITRE lecture with Mariana Kaplan was originally scheduled for April of 2020. And uh, obviously, as you know, the pandemic intervened. Mariana was hoping to present her lecture in per person, so we waited a year, but still we're unable to do so. And rather than postpone again, Mariana will present her lecture in this videocast format that we're so very familiar with now. It's just a Tremendous pleasure for me to um, tell you a bit about Mariana and her many roles at NIH. Uh, we, the NIH, and me personally, are tremendously fortunate um, to have Mariana uh, join us, join uh, the NIH faculty uh, to continue the long history of excellence in lupus research and therapy at the NIH. Mariana is the chief of the NIAM Systemic Autoimmunity Branch. NIAM's Deputy Scientific Director, and she oversees the Lupus Clinical Trials Unit in the NIH Clinical Center. Mariana's current interests include the role of neutrophils and neutrophil extracellular traps in the induction uh, of loss of immunological tolerance and acceleration of organ and vascular damage and autoimmune disease. She's also interested in how type 1 interferons contribute to the de development of premature atherogenesis and vasculopathy in lupus and connective tissue diseases, the use of novel therapies for lupus, and how to identify novel biomarkers and therapeutic targets to mitigate, especially as I mentioned, cardiovascular damage uh, in, in lupus. Mariana obtained her medical degree at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and did her medical residency at the National Institute of Medical Sciences and Nutrition in Mexico City. She then did her rheumatology fellowship and postdoctoral training at the University of Michigan, where she rose to the academic ranks for 15 years to become full professor and was an active member of the multidisciplinary lupus clinic. We were very fortunate in having her come to the NIH in 2013 to lead the systemic autoimmunity branch. And then I recruited her to be NIAM's deputy di director in 2019. Mariana is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. She's a recipient of the Evelyn, Hess, Evelyn V. Hess Award from the Lupus Foundation of America for her outstanding contributions to the field of lupus research, and more recently, the Charles L. Christian Award for significant impact on the understanding of lupus. She sits on numerous boards. She's a council member at the uh, American Association, the Association of, start again, Association of American Physicians on the editorial board of the Journal of Clinical Investigation and the deputy director of the Journal of Arthritis and Rheumatology. On a personal note, I wanted to add that um, Marianne is just fantastic to work with. Every time I call upon her concerning a, a complex or some aspect of uh, the path, pathophysiology of lupus. She responds immediately to my email and communicates brilliantly on um, explaining the uh, patient or the complex science behind my question. In short, she's just a wonderful colleague to have um, in NIAMS, and I'm sure you feel the same way broadly across the NIH. The title of Mariana's talk today is Casting the Net, wa Casting the Net Wide, Neutrophil Shape Chronic Inflammatory uh, Diseases. So thanks, Mariana. Thanks for, for being with us. And thanks for your patience and giving this lecture uh, a year late or so. It's worth the wait. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you very much, John, for this uh, very kind introduction. And I want to say I feel very honored uh, for uh, being, being selected to give the MITRE talk today. And um, as John mentioned, I'm a rheumatologist. And I want to start just by showing you a non-exhaustive list of some of the systemic autoimmune diseases that us as rheumatologists diagnose and treat. 
And they are incredibly challenging with regards to pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, however, while quite heterogeneous, at least several of these diseases do appear to have some commonalities in that they represent a multi-step process um, initially uh, driven by uh, genetic and poorly understood environmental factors uh, that eventually lead to a preclinical phase that probably happens for many years before someone even notices they may have autoimmunity, which is characterized by profound innate and adaptive immune dysregulation. And through environmental factors and stochastic events, an individual will receive a number of hits throughout their lifespan that, uh, lifespan that eventually will lead to, the, to a break in tolerance and the production of autoantibodies that target cellular and extracellular antigens. And we now know that in some patients, these autoantibodies may be present for many years before we can diagnose clinical disease. But eventually, again, through a second, third, or fourth hit, an individual will develop the clinical manifestations of their specific autoimmune disease, and they will go through periods of remission and flare. And as we have gotten better at treating patients with autoimmunity and patients live longer, we are now encountering more and more the chronic complications from prolonged exposure to oxidative stress and, and other factors. And the prototypic systemic autoimmune disease and the one my group has been particularly interested in studying for uh, a few decades is um, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE. And this is considered the great imitator or also called the disease of the thousand faces because it is really profoundly heterogeneous. It can affect almost any organ and system. And uh, commonly we will see that many patients can develop, for example, various types of skin disease and the kidney is an important target in lupus. Now I want to emphasize a few factors about this condition, which is really more a syndrome than a disease. There's probably many different ways to get lupus, but some of the, the things that I'll mention here are important uh, so to understand the, the rest of my talk. Uh, one is that this is a disease that, uh, as many of you know, affects primarily women of childbearing age. So for every man, there are nine women affected by lupus. The other is that uh, the sine qua non to make the diagnosis of lupus is the presence of autoantibodies that target nucleic acids and or proteins that bind to nucleic acids. And if we don't see these autoantibodies, we seriously doubt that the patient has lupus. The other uh, factor I want to mention is that we now know that a significant proportion of lupus patients will exhibit dysregulation in the type one interferon pathway. Either uh, they make more interferons in a chronic way and or their cells tend to respond more to type one interferons. And this is considered an important pathogenic factor in the disease. And lastly, and an area of significant interest uh, for my group, as John mentioned, uh, one of the most significant causes of morbidity and mortality in lupus is a significantly higher risk to develop heart attacks or stroke. And in young women, this can be up to 50 fold compared to women without lupus. And we now know that the reason why they develop uh, these complications is because they exhibit premature atherosclerosis, which is not explained by the traditional Framingham risk factors. And we think that immune dysregulation characteristic of lupus may play very prominent roles. And so the, the key questions for us interested in understanding the development of autoimmunity and particularly lupus has been, how do these ubiquitously express autoantigens, DNA, RNA, histones, become immunogens that can trigger and maintain a strong autoimmune auto, auto response. And for many years, the dogma was that the key mechanism that generated modified autoantigens was through dysregulation in apoptosis. And so that uh, immune cells may die at higher uh, uh, levels uh, uh, by apoptosis in lupus, and also that there was impaired clearance of apoptotic material in these patients. And so that this would lead to eventually accumulation of uh, autoantigens, induction of autoantibodies, a break in self tolerance, and then all the downstream uh, dysregulation that is so typical of lupus. However, uh, uh, this view is 
overly simplistic. And uh, this is understandable because until much more recently, we knew much less about other types of cell death. Uh, but we now know that cells can die in many different ways, not just by apoptosis. And the, we, we, we are getting more and more different types of cell death that we learn about. And it's not only whether a cell dies or not on how it dies, but we believe that it's also important to know which cell is dying and where is the cell dying and where is the, what's the surrounding microenvironment of the dying cell that may, might be very crucial in establishing whether cell death may be immunogenic or tolerogenic and important in autoimmunity. And in that regard, my group has been particularly interested in understanding how neutrophils live and die and how, how this may be an important factor in driving autoimmunity in lupus and other diseases. And I just want to pause here for a moment just to emphasize that um, the, the field of neutrophil biology has really initially lagged behind significantly compared to our understanding of other immune cell types. But through technical advances over the last few years, there has really been a reshaping of how we view neutrophils in the context of homeostasis and disease. And I think we now have switched from thinking neutrophils are this boring monolithic cell type that is there to sense microbes or other dangers, go to the tissues and die and that's it, to thinking that these cells may be placed as a central driver of uh, a variety of, or, or as a shaper of the immunologic landscape in, in health and disease. And just to summarize here a few things, in addition to their antimicrobial roles, we now know that neutrophils are, for example, very important in the regulation of angiogenesis and wound healing. They actually have a variety of suppressive mechanisms in resolution of inflammation and immune suppression in general. And in the context of activation and overactivity, uh, our group has been particularly interested in understanding how this regulation of certain types of neutrophil cell death may be important in modification of autoantigens and autoantigen externalization that in predisposed individuals may drive autoimmunity. And we have also been very interested in understanding the concept of plasticity or cellular heterogeneity in neutrophils, which until recently was something we really didn't think about. We thought all neutrophils were more or less the same. Uh, but there has been a lot of, uh, uh, there have been several advances in thinking about different types of neutrophils and in our case, the role they may play in autoimmunity. And another uh, important uh, uh, factor I want to mention is that we also are also now understanding more and more how different factors may regulate neutrophil biology. And it's interesting to note, for example, that neutrophils have their own circadian rhythm and neutrophil in the morning will look much different than a neutrophil at night. Of course, the microbiome can regulate neutrophil behavior. I will talk a bit about our work on what hormones may do to neutrophils. And of course, changes in life cycle, genetics, and even the tissue microenvironment where the neutrophil may be, may be very key in explaining neutrophil behavior. And in that regard, we have been, while well, most neutrophils die by apoptosis, we have been particularly interested in understanding the role of another type of cell death in the context of autoimmunity. And this is a, a, a very dramatic process if you look at the cellular level where uh, initially described as an antimicrobial strategy, uh, what happens is when neutrophils are exposed to certain danger signals, they undergo a complex uh, downstream signaling cascade that eventually leads to nuclear delobulation and disassemble of both the nuclear envelope and the, the granules uh, membranes of these neutrophils. And the content of the nucleus and the granules mixes inside the cytoplasm. And uh, through the role of proteases and also the activation of enzymes called peptidyl arginine deaminases that citrullinate uh, proteins, there is citrullination of histones and a profound decondensation of the chromatin that as you will you see here occupies almost the whole diameter of the cell. And eventually there is plasma membrane rupture and the extrusion of this meshwork of nuclear material bound to granule proteins that uh, were called neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. And this is a way by which neutrophils die. And while originally described as a strategy by which microbes trap and eventually kill, uh, neutrophils uh, trap and eventually kill microbes, we now know that a variety of sterile inflammatory stimuli that are highly prevalent in autoimmune diseases, including autoantibodies, immune complexes, 
cytokines, but also certain crystals and even drugs that can, can trigger autoimmunity have the ability to induce net formation in the absence of infection. And what's important is that our group and others have described that nets are highly enriched in a variety of autoantigens that are known to be key targets of the immune system in autoimmune diseases. So not only double-stranded DNA and histones in the case of lupus, but there are other molecules such as myeloperoxidase and proteinase 3 that are key targets in ankavasculitis. And because peptidyl arginine deaminase spats are activated, they citrullinate a variety of autoantigens that are known to also be key targets in rheumatoid arthritis. And what we have found is that in lupus and in other autoimmune diseases, there seems to be an imbalance uh, between net formation and net degradation. So uh, in many of these diseases, we see more formation of nets if in the absence of any obvious infection. And at the same time, the mechanisms that degrade these nets appear to be impaired. And so you would have a condition where there is an increased half-life of these nets in blood and in tissues. And this may augment the, the load of autoantigens and contribute to fueling the fire in people predisposed to develop autoimmunity. And what we think this is operational in vivo, because when we have looked at tissues of patients with systemic autoimmunity, in many of these, we find evidence of netting neutrophils uh, uh, infiltrating these tissues. And so th there may also be a vicious cycle because we know that various autoantibodies or immune complexes that are uh, present in patients with autoimmunity, we have found that they have the ability to induce nets. So you would envision a, a mechanism by which nets externalize autoantigens, it might lead to autoantibody production, and in turn, these autoantibodies will trigger more net formation. What is interesting is not all autoantibodies do this, and we're trying to understand why certain autoantibodies or immune complexes have the ability to induce nets while others do not. So uh, this is uh, the, a summary of work from uh, for many years, but uh, what I want to emphasize is, okay, so what if someone makes more nets? Yeah, they may externalize more autoantigens, uh, may they uh, would do these nets to other things. And we know that they can uh, be uh, key inducers of pro-inflammatory responses in, in, through effects in both innate and adaptive immune cells. So nets can, for example, activate the inflammasome machinery in macrophages and induce pro-inflammatory cytokines, thereby exacerbating inflammation further. They can activate plasmocytoidendritic cells, the main type in, uh, one interferon producers, and that may be deleterious in lupus. They activate adaptive immunity, both T cells and B cells, and induce autoantibody production. And importantly, in the context of lupus and other autoimmune diseases, we now know that certain types of nets can be quite harmful to the endothelium and induce endothelial cell damage, which may be important in the development of vasculopathy. And also, the many groups have shown that nets are important activators of coagulation through effects on platelet and on coagulation factors. And something to mention is that the field has really expanded. And we now know uh, from work uh, from our group and others that net risk regulation can be seen in a variety of other autoimmune diseases beyond lupus, in a number of autoinflammatory diseases as well. And if you go outside autoimmunity, we now see more and more evidence that nets are implicated in important, in important pathogenic aspects of atherosclerosis cancer, metabolic diseases. And of course, more recently, we have heard uh, that, COVID, uh, that net dysregulation may be important in mechanisms of tissue damage in COVID-19. Now, nets can also be carriers or messengers uh, uh, of, uh, and, and, and in fact, can, uh, the net material we have found can be internalized by some cells. And for example, in the case of synovial fibroblasts, we have found evidence that nets can take up uh, uh, that, that synovial fibroblasts can take up netic material and that can lead to them acquiring antigen presenting cell capabilities and uh, induce adaptive immunity. Or in a recent study, uh, uh, Luz Blanco in my, lab, in my lab found that nets carry uh, small RNAs and these small RNAs can be taken up by endothelial cells and that can induce pro-inflammatory responses in endothelial cells. So we're learning more and more of these nets as, as messengers that, that, or that carry material to other cells. Now, uh, what are factors that may predispose an individual to form more nets and maybe contribute to enhanced generation of autoantigen before they get autoimmunity? 
So it's interesting that over the last few years, we have found that a variety of genetic polymorphisms that are associated or co that confer higher risk to develop lupus are also associated with a higher risk to form more nets. And one may think, okay, this is a chicken and egg question. Maybe a lupus patient is already making more nets. So if they have this polymorphism, it doesn't mean anything. But actually for some of these polymorphisms, we already know that in people that carry the polymorphism but haven't developed lupus, they already exhibit uh, the ability to form uh, more nets than patients who don't, don't carry the, the genetic polymorphism. And that's, for example, the case of IRF5. So there may be some shared mechanisms here by which genetic factors may drive autoantigen generation and also contribute to lupus in a variety of different ways. The other thing we know is that uh, how neutrophils behave may also depend on whether you're a man or a woman. And this was work uh, that we started as a collaboration with David Furman and Mark Davis at Stanford and uh, was led by Sarta Gupta in, in the lab uh, um, a few years ago. And uh, what was interesting is this started by looking at, if you look at healthy young men and healthy young women, and you look at the, their peripheral blood transcriptome, what are the genes that are different between men and women? And the striking finding was that the, the, the majority of the genes that were differentially regulated were neutrophil associated genes. And this led to the discovery that female neutrophils are significantly more mature at the transcriptional level than male neutrophils. And this translated into finding that female neutrophils are significantly more activated than male neutrophils, and in fact, tend to form nets much more readily than male neutrophils. And this was spontaneous net formation, but also nets upon exposure to microbes or to sterile inflammatory stimuli, suggesting that women have a higher tendency to form autoantigens than men, even if they don't develop autoimmune diseases. Uh, and to think about what does it mean, what, what's, what, what may be other factors that, uh, or other findings that we may see when we compare uh, healthy young women and healthy young men in how their neutrophils behave since some are more mature than others. We also went and looked at the bioenergetics of these cells. And these were studies done by Luz Blanco in the lab. And if you do seahorse analysis and you look at um, mitochondrial respiration, and compare uh, the mitochondrial respiration in males and females, we found that males have a higher mitochondrial respiration, so higher oxygen consumption rate, as, as shown here. And we thought this may be because the male neutrophils are more immature, and therefore they carry more mitochondria. As neutrophils mature, they tend to lose mitochondria. And in fact, when we see here, uh, males have higher levels of mitochondrial DNA and overall higher mitochondrial mass. And what was interesting was that if we take male neutrophils and we add estradiol to them, they acquire the bioenergetic profile of a female neutrophil, which suggested to us that hormones may be driving some of these differences, perhaps in maturation, certainly in bioenergetics. So uh, as a follow-up study, uh, Sartak uh, went on and uh, purified neutrophils from healthy young men and healthy young women, and we did transcriptome analysis. And the main difference between them was that female neutrophils tended to have significantly higher expression of type one interferon regulated genes. And this, uh, as you can see it here, when we generate an interference score is significantly higher. This was not because the uh, females have higher levels of circulating type one interferons or higher levels of type one interferon receptor in their neutrophils, but rather it appears to be a hyper responsiveness to circulating levels of type one interference, which we think is related to the enhanced maturation status. And what's important to notice is that this appears to be restricted to neutrophils. If we do single cell RNA sequencing and we compare the level of type one interferon regulated genes in other cell types between men and women, we don't see any significant differences. But when we looked at the neutrophils, clearly the female neutrophils are hyper responding to, to type one interference. And, and what this all may mean in the context of autoimmunity is that female neutrophils, A, generate more autoantigens to that formation, B, they respond more to type one interference. And this could be quite relevant in driving immunopathology. And this is something we are exploring uh, further. It, conversely, if you think about infections and the fact that women uh, respond better to infections, uh, this may give some explanation or a partial explanation on, on, on why. And this could also have relevance in the context of COVID-19 because as we know, men tend to have poorer prognosis than, than women. And so um, 
why is this happening? Again, we don't have exact the, the total answer, but we of course ask is this a chromosomal uh, influence, the extra X chromosome, or is this mediated by hormones? And uh, what we did here, and these were studies done by Schwitcher and Acabo in the lab, was we took patients with Kleinefelter syndrome that, as you know, are XXY, have an extra X chromosome, and we thought, okay, this is there's an effect of the X chromosome on the differences in neutrophil biology, we would see that the Kleinefelter males would behave, the neutrophils would behave more like females. But in fact, they were very similar to the non-Kleinefelter males in their type 1 interferon responses, suggesting this is not an X chromosome driven phenomenon. And similarly, when we studied prepubescent children, uh, we found that boys and girls, neutroph neutrophils were no different to each other. So again, supporting that this may be hormonally driven and that sex hormones may be altering the maturation status of the neutrophils. So I'm gonna move now to talk a bit about this concept of neutrophil heterogeneity in the context of autoimmunity. And to start, I would like to say that even in young healthy adults, not all neutrophils are the same, at least at the transcriptome level. And these were RNA sequencing studies, single cell RNA sequencing studies that we did in healthy young uh, females and male neutrophils. And what we found is that we, there were at least four different types of neutrophils. And these were studies done by Gustav Biggerblatt and Liam O'Neill in the lab. And the subset that hyper responds to neutrophils, although type one interferon responsive neutrophil subset is one of them that you can see here. And here again, you can see that sing by single cell RNA sequencing, this subset of neutrophils is the one that uh, where women seem to hyper respond. It's not that they have more of this neutrophil subset, it's that those, that subset seems to be the hyper responsive one. Now, going back to autoimmunity, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, we realized and we, we were trying to isolate peripheral blood mononuclear cells from lupus patients doing a FICOL gradient. And typically when you do this type of gradient, the neutrophils will go to the bottom because they have higher density close to the red blood cells, whereas the mononuclear cells will tend to float higher. But when we were isolating these mononuclear cells, we were only finding a pretty good amount of neutrophils. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out if this was an artifact or if this was just an epiphenomenon. And what we discovered after a lot of work was that this indeed represents a distinct neutrophil subset with pro-inflammatory features that, is present, that are present at high levels in patients with lupus. So these low density granulocytes that we call or LDGs have a higher ability to form pro-inflammatory cytokines. They can drive aberrant B cell responses in the bone marrow. They have an ability to activate T cells, so they are not suppressive cells. And one of the most striking features is that when we take these cells out of the circulation, they are already maxed out in their ability to form nets. So they make significantly more nets in the absence of any stimulation than neutrophils from the same patient that are normal density. And so uh, what the, from lupus, we have gone and, and, and looked into uh, other diseases, and we have found that certain uh, all other autoimmune diseases uh, also carry higher levels of these low density granulocytes. And even some monogenic uh, or inflammatory syndromes do the same. And what several of these diseases share is perhaps a higher rate of vasculopathy or vascular damage as part of their clinical spectrum. So we have hypothesized that these cells. Uh, may play a role in vascular damage. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in, in the next slides. So how are these cells different uh, besides the fact that we find them at different levels in the, in the FICOL gradient? So when we have done RNA sequencing analysis, and this was worked out by Prakash Mistry, um, we found here in a principal component analysis, you will see that the low density granulocytes shown in red look much more different than their autologous normal density neutrophils from the same lupus patients shown in blue. And these normal dense neutrophils look much more like healthy control neutrophils. So at the transcriptome level, they are different, even if they have been exposed in theory to the same uh, inflammatory milieu. And not shown here, we have also done attack sequencing and, and found similar differences between in the epigenetic landscape between the low density granulocytes and the neutrophils from the same patients that are normal density. And uh, what, what I want to emphasize here is uh, for, for many investigators have uh, uh, hypothesized that these low density granulocytes perhaps represent 
some sort of emergency granulopoiesis response, a premature release from the bone marrow uh, due to a variety of factors. However, when we have done single cell RNA sequencing analysis in peripheral blood mononuclear cells from lupus patients, uh, first, as shown here, we find the low density granulocytes, which typically you don't see in healthy people. But uh, the, what I want to emphasize is that uh, if you look at the transcriptome of the most abundant type of low density granulocytes, they display uh, evidence of uh, mature uh, granulocyte signature. And there is only a very small percentage of these cells, which are different from, from the cluster here, that uh, appear to represent uh, bona fide immature granulocytes. And the other thing I want to emphasize is that the, the type of interference signature, as I mentioned, appears to be it is a very characteristic finding in lupus patients. And it's associated with bad disease activity and other complications. And if you look at PBMCs by single cell RNA sequencing, it is the low density granulocytes that appear to be responsible for a significant part of the type one interference signature in lupus patients. Now, what happens at the level of the proteins? And this is a very heavy slide, uh, 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 very busy. It's not for you to really read it. But what I want to emphasize is we did, um, uh, Katie Bashant in the lab did a comprehensive proteomic and phosphoproteomic analysis of low density granulocytes and compare this to the protein cargo of normal dense neutrophils from the same patients or from controls. And as you can see here with the red, there were many proteins that were differentially regulated in these low density granulocytes. And one, uh, one group that really um, stood out was pro were proteins that are associated with regulating biomechanical properties of these cells, how these cells may move in circulation, how they may, uh, how their acting cytoskeleton may be, uh, may be modified, et cetera. And so we, hypothesize that maybe this difference in the proteome and in the biomechanical properties of the cells that we confirm by using a technology called RTDC may be changing the ability of these neutrophils to migrate in small blood vessels. And so here we design a 3D mimetic that kind of recapitulates what would happen to a neutrophil that travels through small blood vessels, for example, in the lung or, or other tissues. And we measured the, the percentage of these cells that were retained in the mimetic. And what was very striking is that when we look at percentage retained uh, in the mimetic uh, and compare different types of neutrophils, we found that the low density granulocytes were significantly more retained in the vasculature than uh, the other types of neutrophils, either from lupus or even more from healthy controls. And this was not related to a higher ability to bind to endothelial cells, which was really not different. But it does appear that these changes in biomechanical properties of the cells do hamper the ability of these low density granulocytes to travel through blood vessels. And this could have implications uh, for, for vasculopathy, for thrombotic complications in the microvasculature that are quite common in patients with lupus. So we, we continue to try to find out uh, how relevant is this finding in the in, the, in, the in vivo context. Now, we probably all make nets at some point and uh, when we get exposed to uh, bugs, and of course we, we don't develop autoimmunity just because we, we make nets. And of course the host uh, and, and the genetic makeup of the host is key. But one question we have asked is, are all nets created equal? And are nets generated by these uh, uh, low density granulocytes, for example, more immunogenic than nets that are generated in the context of an infection? So uh, work done by, by Luz Blanco, uh, where uh, she purified uh, healthy control nets and low density granulocyte nets and exposed myeloid cells to these nets to assess the induction of type 1 interferon responses, show that while nets in general do a pretty good job at inducing type 1 interferon responses, clearly the lupus nets do a better job at that. So they are more interferogenic. And uh, work done by Carmelo Carmona Rivera, looking at how nets may modify vascular function, show that if you take um, thoracic aortas from mice and, ex and put them on a myograph and look at their ability to relax in response to acetylcholine in the presence or absence of nets as a measure or as a readout of vascular function, he found that if you treat these aortas with low density granulocyte nets, they severely impair the vascular function of these aortas. Whereas if you use nets from healthy individuals, 
that's not really the case. So this has suggested that it appears that at least in part, some of these differences may be driven by the protein content and the post-translational modifications present in these nets that are different in people with autoimmunity than in people without autoimmunity. But the other factor that we think is quite relevant in why nets in the context of autoimmunity may be deleterious is that when we, uh, when, and this was a collaboration we did with Keith Elkins group at uh, the University of Washington and in the lab was driven by Luz Blanco. When we take healthy control neutrophils and we expose them to uh, lupus relevant stimuli like RMP immune complexes, but not to bacteria, for example, these neutrophils will produce a lot of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. And when that happens, there is enhanced oxidation of the mitochondrial DNA, which lies in close proximity to these sources of ROS. And the, the neutrophils exposed to these immune complexes rely on mitochondrial ROS production to form nets. And when these nets are created, they are highly enriched in oxidized mitochondrial DNA. And in fact, we found that low density granulocytes heavily rely on the production of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species to make nets, because if we add a mitochondrial growth scavenger, they fail to do so. And if we add a mitochondrial growth scavenger to lupus prone mice, we can act significantly abrogate the development of disease features, suggesting that this dysregulated mitochondrial ROS production may be pathogenic in lupus. Now, in general, I would say that what, what we have found is that Net, net formation is highly conducive to nucleic acid oxidation. Not only mitochondrial DNA, as I mentioned, but because the chromatin becomes a condensed, the idea is that the, DNA, the genomic DNA may be less protected from oxidation by the histones and more exposed to uh, sources of ROS in the neutrophil. And, this, uh, and, and we have found something similar for RNA. So this increased oxidation in nucleic acids uh, uh, leads to, first of all, these nucleic acids can be taken up by target cells. And when they are internalized, they are much less likely to be degraded by nucleases such as TREX1, and much more likely to be sensed by intracellular sensors of DNA, such as the CGAS sting pathway. And this is a pathway that is quite relevant in the production of type 1 interferons. So we consider that this is a key mechanism that may make the generation of autoantigens by nets much more deleterious that perhaps the generation of antigens uh, by, by other uh, uh, types of cell death, which do not lead to oxidation of nucleic acids. And is this relevant in vivo? So this was work led by Moshe Arditi at Cedar sinai with whom we had the opportunity to collaborate. And they studied a mouse model of lupus called the, called, called the Pristen mouse model of lupus, where you give an intraperitoneal injection of Pristen, and six months later, the mice develop over uh, lupus features. And what was fun is that first, these mice developed significantly enhanced levels of oxidized uh, uh, DNA uh, when they are uh, induced to develop lupus. But then what we studied was what happens if you induce pristin in mice that lack OGG1, which is a DNA repair enzyme that cuts and repairs oxidized DNA lesions. And in that case, the mice got much worse when they couldn't get rid of the oxidized DNA. They got a significantly worse rash, significantly enhanced skin uh, thickness, an enhanced production of a variety of type 1 interferon regulated genes, and significantly higher levels of photoantibodies. Again, supporting that oxidized nucleic acids are significantly pathogenic in this disease, and they may be generated by neutrophils. And in another great collaboration, and this was work led by Jay Chung at NHLBI, uh, the, the finding here was that if, um, if you, uh, in conditions of, of uh, oxidative stress, such as what may happen in lupus, there is increased oligomerization of a molecule called voltage-dependent anion channel one or VDAC1. And VDAC1, when it oligomerizes, leads to the leakage of mitochondrial DNA into the cytoplasm. And what was clear is that this was happening in, in the cells from lupus patients. And uh, when oligomerization of this molecule was inhibited and therefore the mitochondrial DNA could, couldn't escape into the cytoplasm and therefore in, uh, promote downstream responses that led to type one interference. And this was done using a compound that inhibits the oligomerization. Lupus prone mice had significant decreases in their clinical phenotype and significant decreases in type 1 interferon responses. Again, recapitulating, indicating that 
uh, oxidation of nucleic acids, this regulation in mitochondrial DNA localization appear to be key factors that may drive autoimmunity and that, that again may be trigger, triggered by dysregulated neutrophil function. So what about uh, NETs and LDGs in other autoimmune diseases? And I'm just gonna give you a couple of uh, uh, quick vignettes and then I'll go back to lupus to try to talk about how we can modulate this. So uh, when I, uh, short after I moved to NIH, uh, Peter Grayson, who uh, heads the vasculitis uh, group, um, approached me and said, look, I, I've been uh, looking at the RNA sequencing data from this landmark study uh, that had been published in the New England Journal of Medicine that had compared rituximab versus cyclophosphamide in ANCA-associated vasculitis. And while this was a very effective treatment. There were, there were patients that show a decreased response to the treatment. And when we had looked at the RNA sequencing data, he had seen that the, the signature that associates with poor response to treatment pretty much completely overlap with the gene signature we had described for our lupus low density granulocytes. So uh, uh, Carmelo uh, uh, took it from here and he the idea was, are these low density granulocytes also present in patients with ankyovasculitis? And he found that's the case. And importantly, similar to lupus, these low density granulocytes have a very robust capacity to form nets, externalize autoantigens, and we think they may play an important role in damaging the vasculature. And so the idea here, and we try to keep, uh, we hope to keep investigating, is can these uh, low density granulocytes be used as a predictive factor that a patient may be less likely to respond to treatment. And not only in ankyovasculitis, but we have also found that NETs and dysregulation in low density granulosas may be implicated in drug-induced vasculitis. So this is a, a very distinct condition called levamisole-induced vasculitis, which happens in people that consume cocaine that is tainted with levamisole. In the US, a significant proportion of cocaine actually is contaminated with levamisole. And these patients develop a very distinct type of vasculitis with, um, uh, as, with several other antibodies that developed uh, uh, at the same time. And what we found is that um, uh, patients, uh, uh, neutrophils that are exposed to levamisole tend to form a lot of nets. And the mechanism is that levamisole is a muscarinic agonist and neutrophils express a variety of muscarinic receptors. And levamisole was able to induce net formation by engaging these muscarinic receptors. And in fact, if we added atropine if, uh, to, to this system, we were able to inhibit net formation. So just think an additional mechanism of neuroimmunomodulation by which drugs may be able to induce uh, autoimmunity. And the other disease I want to mention briefly is the role of nets in um, idiopathic inflammatory myopathies, uh, dermatomyositis, juvenile dermatomyositis, which shares many features to lupus in that it is considered a type one interferon dependent disease. There's a lot of vasculopathy uh, implicated and of course, significant muscle damage. And this was a, a very nice collaboration with Lisa Ryder and Andy Mammon's group, and primarily led by a very talented postdoc, Nikki Seto, and uh, a visiting fellow, Jiram Torres Ruiz. And just to summarize, what we found is that similar to lupus, patients with this condition also have these low density granulocytes that make a lot of nets and they have a lot of nets in the circulation. But what do these nets do in the context of muscle, the inflammatory muscle disease? So first we found that there is a lot of, that there were biopsies where we could see a lot of net formation inside the muscle. And uh, what we found to, working with, with Andy Mamen's group was that what it appears that nets do is that here we are looking at skeletal muscle uh, myotubes, uh, which are important components of the muscle. And so you can see that when we add nets from these myositis patients, there are significant decreases in the number of myotubes. So there's a toxic effect from the nets. And the effect can be blocked if we block histones, which are very abundant in the nets. And when we try to recapitulate this by adding histone alone, we couldn't really see a whole lot of effect on damaging the, the, the myotubes. But what, when we citrullinated in vitro the histone, and as I mentioned, there is a lot of citrullination in peptides in the neutrophil that are um, externalized by nets, then we see a recapitulation of what the nets do. So it appears that through a citrullinated histone-mediated effect, nets can harm skeletal uh, muscle cells and this may be implicated in the pathogenesis of the disease. 
So I want to uh, spend uh, the last part of my talk talking about how can we modulate this and can we use vascular damage as a readout of what neutrophils may be doing in autoimmunity. And so, as I mentioned before, vasculopathy and premature atherosclerosis are, are, are very important causes of morbidity and mortality in lupus. And uh, uh, we have a vascular cohort, uh, uh, vascular lupus cohort at the NIH, uh, and we have worked very closely with Nehal Metas Group at NHLBI in, uh, in doing a, a multimodal assessment of preclinical vascular disease in these patients. And just to summarize here, some of the key findings is that when we do FDG PET CT to look at vascular wall inflammation in lupus patients, compare them with control, you can see here all these red and yellow here suggesting that you know, the vascular wall of lupus patients is significantly inflamed. And this associates with findings when we do coronary CT that lupus patients tend to have a significantly higher burden of uh, non-calcified plaque when compared to age and gender match controls. So a lot of pre, uh, subclinical uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease. Now, uh, going back to our hypothesis, we have posited that lupus represents perhaps an extreme phenotype of vascular damage where diverse components of the innate immune system, primarily type one interference and uh, dysregulated neutrophil biology may converge here to form a pathophysiological alliance that may accelerate autoimmunity. So can we start testing this more in the clinical setting? And uh, what uh, Phil Carlucci and Monica Pormalek, two very talented postdocs in the lab, did was they started to look at what factors would associate with enhanced non-calcified coronary plaque burden. And as I mentioned, the Framingham risk factors in lupus typically don't explain a lot of the findings that we think about risk factors for coronary artery disease. Uh, but what was interesting is that the higher the levels in circulation of low density granulocytes, the more, the, the higher the degree of non-calcified plaque burden. And this association persisted after adjusting for multiple confounders, suggesting that if you have higher levels of LDGs as a lupus patient, you are more likely to have more severe coronary artery disease. And when we did RNA sequencing to look at what signatures may associate with having more plaque, it was again, those patients that had uh, high levels of non-calcified plaque or high levels of vascular inflammation tended to have higher expression of the genes that are associated with having low density granulocytes compared to those lupus patients that we have more like controls. So although this is not a causal proof, it does suggest that these regulated neutrophils in lupus are playing a prominent role in vascular damage. And another mechanism by which neutrophils may do this is that when nets are formed, they externalize a variety of oxidative enzymes. And we have found that these enzymes have the ability to oxidize HDL, which as you know, is the good lipoprotein, the, the anti-atherogenic lipoprotein. And when this HDL becomes oxidized, it loses many of its atheroprotective capabilities. And this impairs cholesterol efflux capacity, the ability of the HDL to remove cholesterol from cells and therefore prevent foam cell formation, for example, in the arteries. And it also leads to enhanced uh, inflammation, which may drive plaque formation. And so uh, the idea is that this is an additional mechanism that we can study to see how neutrophils may modify uh, vascular risk in lupus patients. And, and, and here again, the idea is that type 1 interference may be involved because they may prime neutrophils to form more nets, even if by themselves they don't do it in the, abs in the presence of immune complexes. So how can we start testing this hypothesis and how can we target nets? And this is tricky because of course, ideally you want to do something that will be selective. We don't want to hit the neutrophils with something that will limit their antimicrobial properties. And a few of the strategies we have been interested in exploring is one, using these PAD inhibitors that as I mentioned, PADs are important enzymes in, in, in promoting net formation. And we know that mice that don't have PADs will not make a net or will make them at lower levels. Other things that we have been interested in is for example, modifying uh, mitochondrial dysregulation as, as mentioned before, our ROS production. Uh, so that this is more at the preclinical level, and we have done both chemical uh, approaches, pharmacological approaches, and knockout approaches, and try to see what happens if we get rid of the PAD enzymes that are important in, in net formation. And indeed, you can see that in knockout systems in, in mice, if we get rid of uh, PAD4 uh, and the mice don't make nets, they actually have significantly less immune complex deposition 
than the wild type mice that can make nets. And uh, we can also modify autoantibody production, uh, as mentioned here, as shown here. And uh, in, in a study uh, led by Yu Dong Lu, uh, we found that even in non lupus mice, but in a, a mouse model of atherosclerosis, if we get rid of uh, PAD4, specifically in the myeloid cell compartment in the neutrophils, the mice, the mice will develop much less atherosclerotic plaques. Suggesting that this may be a strategy an effective strategy. This is still at the preclinical level. Several companies are interested in uh, coming up with PAD4 specific inhibitors, but it's early to tell whether this will be able to be used in humans or not. Now, I, I mentioned that type 1 interference are important uh, primers of net production. So the way, the initial way we had to test this is um, there is this drug that was developed by AstraZeneca called anifrolumab, which is an inhibitor of the type 1 interferon receptor. So the drug inhibits signaling through the type 1 interferon receptor, and it's been, it has been tested in uh, lupus and other autoimmune diseases in uh, phase 2 and phase 3 trials. And uh, when we established a collaboration with them, the study had ended, the phase 2 study had ended, so we couldn't, we didn't have much say on what type of samples we could get, but we were able to obtain serum and plasma samples at baseline and a year post-treatment. And what we tried to assess was, okay, if we only have serum or plasma to test, can we see if being on type 1 interference will mitigate net formation and perhaps also lead to improvements in uh, HDL function as a readout of uh, the effect on cardiovascular disease. And so, uh, uh, this is just to show you that lupus patients in circulation have significantly higher levels of circulating net remnants. And when we compare what happens when the patients were on an anti type 1 interferon receptor strategy, those patients that received the drug actually had significant decreases in the levels of circulating nets, while those that were on placebo had significant in uh, increases in the levels of nets, suggesting that blocking type 1 interferon receptor could mitigate net formation. And when we looked at HDL function by measuring this ability of HDL to remove cholesterol from cells. We found that first, of course, at baseline, lupus patients have much worse uh, uh, function of the HDL than healthy controls. And on those on placebo, there was a little bit of an improvement, but it was not significant. While those that were on um, the anafrilomab group had a 17% increase in cholesterol efflux capacity, which is not an easy thing to achieve even with uh, well-established drugs to control cardiovascular risk. So suggesting that modulating type 1 interferon responses could also modulate ca some cardiometabolic parameters that are considered uh, to be deleterious in, 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 in cardiovascular risk. And the next strategy we have, uh, we have started to explore is what about the JAK-STAT pathway? And so, uh, as you know, JAK-STAT pathway is a fundamental pathway by which cytokines signal in cells. And it is, of course, highly relevant for type 1 interference, which use the JAK-STAT pathway uh, uh, for their effects on, on target cells. But neutrophils also have a very active JAK-STAT uh, signaling pathway, and many cytokines crucial for neutrophil biology signal through the JAK-STAT pathway. And in previous studies we had done with uh, Massimo Gadina and John O'Shea's group, we had found that if you give tofacitinib to lupus prone mice, the mice actually get significantly better. They get less kidney disease, less uh, skin disease, less immune dysregulation. And intrigue, uh, what was intriguing is that when we looked at the ability of the mice to form nets, we also saw that tofacitinib was a potent repressor of net formation in vitro and in vivo. So uh, um, with the leadership of Sarfarad Hasni uh, in the lupus clinical trial units, we, we launched a, a phase one study to test tofacitinib in lupus patients. This was a small study in 30 patients, 20 of those who received tofacitinib, and it, it was a short term duration study of uh, uh, 56 days with a follow-up of another month. Interestingly, this in a way was uh, uh, one of the first studies to do this, or if not the first one, we actually randomized the patients on whether they have the presence or absence of the STAT4 risk allele, which is uh, a risk allele for lupus, but we were interested to see if those that had the STAT4 risk allele would actually respond different to the drug. And uh, the drug was safe, which this was a phase one study. So the most important thing is the drug was safe. Um, but uh, we also used the study to learn more about JAK-STAT regulation of neutrophil responses and vascular damage. 
And interestingly, when the, the, the group that was on tofacitinib had significant decreases in the long number of low density granulocytes when compared to those patients that were on placebo, we, which actually saw increases. And this appeared to be a selective response because when we look globally at neutrophils, we didn't see any significant changes in neutrophil counts, but they appeared to change this dysregulated neutrophil subset. And in patients who were stat four risk allele positive, we found that being on tofacitinib led to significant decreases in the levels of NEPS. So tofacitinib seems to modulate dysregulated neutrophil function in lupus patients. Not surprisingly, the drug also led to a decrease in the type 1 interference signature, so it may have a dual role in modulating those two aberrant responses in lupus. And even with the very short duration of the study, we found that those that received tofacitinib significantly improved their HDL function. And this was a much shorter time than what we saw with the type 1 interferon uh, receptor blockade. And finally, and most importantly, when we looked at level of arterial stiffness in these patients, those that were on placebo actually increased their arterial stiffness, which is a bad thing, uh, during the duration of the trial, while those that were on tofacitinib saw a decrease in arterial stiffness. So while this is an early study, and of course there is now uh, uh, you know, a, a signal that uh, may be deleterious with the use of these drugs because of their, they may have an enhanced risk of, for thrombosis, we do also have a signal that the, the drug could be vasculoprotective in the context of lupus. So we will really have to decide how we want to explore this further and balancing risk versus benefit. But this is giving us some more insight into the pathogenic pathways that may impact outcomes in our patients. So I would like to end here. I, I just want to summarize. Uh, I went through a lot of things, so I want to summarize a couple of the points. One is um, I, I believe that sex differences in, in neutrophil biology and certainly to be exploring other cell types may play an important role in the differential risk for autoimmunity. And this is something we need to better understand to see if the, uh, some uh, the, the factors that do this can be modulated. Uh, that uh, I, I hope I convey that uh, we, we consider that neutrophil dysregulation and the formation of nets may be an important source of modification of autoantigens that may promote uh, and perpetuate pathogenic autoimmunity in individuals at risk that a main mechanism by way this happens is through the selective oxidation of nucleic acids by this type of cell death that may propagate uh, aberrant immune responses. And of course, the most important thing and what we're focusing on is whether targeting specific neutrophil subsets and finding a way to do this will contribute to mitigate end organ damage in people with lupus and other autoimmune diseases. And finally, I want to, oh, I have my, I don't know what happened, I have my, uh, Thank you, slide. Uh, oh my God, let me see if I can. Oh, here it is. Um, so I, I, I want to end by thanking um, uh, a lot of people that have been involved. Uh, first and foremost, uh, current and former members of my lab that were involved in the experiments I presented today. I've been uh, uh, very privileged to work with uh, very talented people who have really uh, made very significant contributions to advancing our research. Uh, the, the immense support uh, uh, of the lupus clinical trial units and uh, the great leadership of Sarfaraz Hasni. My uh, great, the great support from NIAMS and NIAMS leadership, in particular from John O'Shea, to be able to do uh, all these studies and always supporting us in, in doing this, and all my great collaborators at NIAMS and, and uh, other NIH institutes that I'm mentioning here, and also uh, the great collaborators uh, at other academic institutions. And thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions. That's terrific, Mariana. And maybe you can't hear the applause from where you are, but I, I can hear the applause. It's just, it's deafening. And so um, we have a few questions here. Um, maybe we'll start with that. Um, but first I have to repeat the, the code for the CME, um, 31312, 31312. I hope I got that right, uh, uh, Chris. Um, Let's see, um, I have a, a couple of questions here. So one is maybe we'll start with the most important one. So this is a question from a patient and the question slash statement is I have lupus. Marrow transplant, thank you for your research. 
and and I thank you as well for your research. But thank you. maybe take give it a sh give this question a shot. Sorry, John, you got cut a bit. Could you repeat the the question? Sorry, I just saw that. Okay, try again. Um, I have lupus. Treatment works well. What would it take to find a cure? CRISPR, gene therapy, bone marrow transplant. Thank you for your research. Thank you. I mean, this is a very important question and something we are thinking about all the time. And as you know, I think what's complex here is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't think lupus is a single disease. So I think where, where, where things will begin to advance even more, although there have been many significant advances, is in understanding what pathways are driving disease in specific patients. So doing more of a personalized medicine approach uh, that has worked so well in, in other conditions, in certain cancers, et cetera. So I think that's where we really need to focus to, to start to understand what is driving your disease versus the disease that is present in other patients that are also diagnosed by, with lupus. Okay, we have another question here, which is a question you've actually all of us have heard from time to time, but you, you can take your shot at answering the question. The question is, can you have autoantibodies to nucleic acids, but not have SLE? Yes, the answer is yes. So uh, if you were to measure autoantibodies in the general population, which we don't want to do, but, uh, you will find that there are people that will have autoantibodies and never develop autoantibodies. Um, as we age, uh, we tend to have more of those because our immune systems age too and they don't behave as normal as they should. Uh, but of course, the key question is, uh, what else do you need uh, to, to make this become an autoimmune process? And in some cases, we think these autoantibodies may appear and maybe go away, like in the case of infections or certain drugs. In some cases, if you have the, the wrong genes, uh, they may be persistent and tend to increase in, in in numbers and then you know eventually if something happens in the environment you may be more likely to develop autoimmunity but yes this can happen in people without an autoimmune disease uh, another question could female neutrophils be more sensitive to interferon gamma yes uh Good question. We don't know. It's something we should test. I think because the gene signature was so type 1 interferon driven, of course, there's always a lot of overlap. We focus on that. But um, what happens to other cytokines is something that is you know, definitely worth looking. Are there specific proteins that hold nets together? Yeah, so the scaffold of the nets is uh, yeah, it's a combination. It, it, it's also a charge has a lot to do with how you know nets develop. So, yes, histones are an important component and are very abundant in the nets, and certainly they need to be there. I think to see the structure that we see. But the nucleic acids are also a very important part of the structure. So uh, it looks like we're almost we're we're out of questions here. But I'll ask one of my own before we uh, end here. And Mariana, as you know, whenever you talk about male neutrophils being immature, right, I always um, find that very entertaining on many levels. And so in thinking about male neutrophils being immature, do males ever catch up? Oh, that's, that's a great question, John. So we, when we focus initially in the studies, we, we, we focus on young adults. Uh, but we really need to expand this to understand what happens as people age. And yes, th does this change? Or do female neutrophils become more immature? It is interesting, I didn't mention that during pregnancy, female neutrophils become more like male neutrophils. And we wonder what does have to do with tolerating you know, the fetus and, and whether it's a protective mechanism, but certainly supporting, again, a hormonal component. So I think we need to better understand what happens throughout the lifespan. And, and yeah, if men catch up or, or women regress. <laughs> <laughs> and males with lupus, the, are their neutrophils more, more mature or? Yeah, great question. It's something we want to look at, but we don't have enough of them to make any conclusions at this point, but we definitely need to look at that as well. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't see any more questions in the, in the chat box. And I guess you have a tea coming up. So uh, I'll just say thank you.
really thank you so much for coming to the NIH. I think you've done amazing work here and you just do perfect work for the NIH. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. John. And I'll stop. Thank you very much.